All right, hey, thanks uh, for showing up, everybody. Uh, my name is Dana Ferrars. This is Lavi Shero. Um, we're gonna talk today about undergraduate research in medicinal chemistry in my labs. Um, and specifically, Lavi's gonna talk about what she did last summer. Um, and hopefully we keep it very light. Um, I wanna just make it clear, if you have questions at any point during this talk, uh, please, please interrupt, you know, feel free to interrupt, throw some something at me, whatever. Um, so, you know, outline of the talks right here, we're gonna give a little bit about our background. I, I think uh, most of you guys that know me know that I'm not the traditional uh, uh, professorial type. Um, Lobby's gonna give a little bit about her background. She is what we would call a non-traditional student. Is that the buzz line that we use? But um, anyways, we're gonna talk about that for a little bit. Then what we're trying to accomplish you know, with undergraduate research, that is, is perhaps the most important uh, piece today. If you take nothing else home, look what we're trying to do, and then at the end, I'm gonna kind of wrap back around and say, you know, what, what worked, what didn't. Um, my background, uh, your know, background in science as well, so the science, this is a part where, you know, you may go, go to sleep, and that, you know, I, I totally get it. I, I totally get it. I'll try my best to, to make it so at an understandable level, because I know there's not a lot of uh, uh, medicinal chemists in the audience. Um, but basically, the meat of the talk is three parts. The first part is, is kind of laying the groundwork for how we got interested in the coronavirus and trying to, to make antivirals. Um, it's a pretty important piece of the story. Uh, it, it may not have seemed so at the time we were doing it, but looking back on it, it was some really valuable work. Um, and then part two is, is really what we made and what we used uh, those compounds for. Um, so basically chemical probes to really decipher a little bit about how the coronavirus replication cycle and immune response works. Um, and then the last part is, is Lobby's part. She's gonna talk about um, designing antivirals, so designing and making the molecules themselves. And we've got props with her. She brought her, her lab notebook, for example. So, and then acknowledgments, of course, at the end. So a uh, little bit about myself. I, my background is actually in um, industry. So I spent 15 years working at, you know, interestingly enough, Guilford MGI and Azi. You know, it may look like I have this, this breadth of pharmaceutical experience. And, and, and in reality, one company bought the other, and then that big company bought, bought them. So I, so I had the same desk for like, you know, 10 years, uh, but at the same company. Um, anyways, 10 years of, of, of uh, pharmaceutical experience. We moved to Johns Hopkins, did drug discovery there. So we s uh, established what, what is now Johns Hopkins Drug Discovery. Um, in that period of time, I was very fortunate. I worked with a tremendous group of people um, to discover this drug right here. This is uh, cetazuridine. It's an anti-cancer uh, drug. So um, I've had a little background in the field, and I enjoy it. There's nothing more challenging than a career in medicinal chemistry. Um, however, you know, it got a little tiresome to, to beg for money and write grants all the time. And I was doing that at Hopkins, and I said, okay, well, you know, what I really enjoy doing is, is teaching. Hopkins gave me that, that um, ability, and I also uh, mentoring students, and they also allowed me to do that. So I said, hey, you know, if I want to do that, I'll just do that full time. And so I took the plunge and the salary cut. Um, <laughs> To go to Stevenson for a year. I taught there for one year, and then I taught. I've been at McDaniel since 2015, so this is the seventh year here. Um, now, Lobby is going to introduce herself. So as many of you know, I come from um, Transylvania, Romania, and uh, that was the view I woke up to every single morning. Um, I graduated high school in 2009. Then I went on um, to do my dental school in, uh, at the University of Oradea in Romania. Uh, graduated in 2015 with a, dental, a Doctor of Dental Surgery degree. After that, I decided I want to continue my studies in the U.S. Uh, I wasn't sure how I'm going to do at a four-year college, so I took a trial semester at Carroll Community College. Then I transferred here, and um, I've been at McDaniel since 2019. I still have one more year left, but um, on campus, I do a lot. Uh, I'm a biology major, chemistry and international studies um, minor. I'm in ROTC. Uh, I'm also what is called the SMP, which means I'm in ROTC and the Maryland National Guard. Uh, I'm part of um, APO, which is Alpha Phi Omega, the National Service Fraternity. Uh, I'm part of Beta Beta Beta, which is the uh, Biology Honor Society, and also the Vice President of Gamma Sigma Epsilon, which is the Chemistry Honor Society. And mother of two. 
I don't even know how to follow <laughs> that. I mean, like, th that's a list of stuff. Uh, yeah, that I didn't do that. I was not that kid in college. <laughs> <laughs> not that kid in college. Okay, um, so let's start off this by, you know, moving to where you, Hopkins, where you had everything, and industry, where you had everything, to, to small liberal arts college. How do you do research in that environment? There, there's a lot of challenges, obviously, the primary one being budgetary. Um, Lack of students, you know, at any given year, McDaniel's chemistry majors may number, you know, on one hand, you can probably count them all, you know. Um, and then willingness, are the students interested in what you're interested in? You know, that's always a, a factor. Um, and then student schedules, it's a real pain to try and do anything during the semester when, when they have their schedule and you have yours just near the twain shall meet. Um, and then, of course, time constraints, um, you know, typically for, for, for most of, um, at least my department, where most of the work gets done is over the summer where it's your primary focus, and that's pretty much what um, we're gonna talk about today. Learning objectives um, are on this slide. So what I wanted to do, you know, anytime you set out on a course or, or design a new course, you gotta have your learning objectives. And for, for undergraduate research, this is what I put together, you know, and this was kind of back of the envelope stuff when, when, you know, my provost said, hey, I need you to write down on paper what your learning objectives are so we can, you know, have it documented. So I did, I said, you know, I want to be able to work in a team. That's number one. Um, I wanted to problem solve, you know, on their own. And, and within a matter of weeks there, they got pretty good at that. Um, learning modern methods of data mining and searching, that goes without saying. Learning how to publish and how to do what she's doing right now is presenting. Um, and then yeah, most of my students don't end up going into chemistry. I know that sounds weird. Um, but they become doctors and dentists and PAs and whatnot. Uh, anybody, though, in those fields should have an, actually anybody anywhere should have an appreciation of what goes in to drug discovery. It is a, a billion dollars, that typically multi-billion dollars it takes to make um, an idea into a drug. And I want them to appreciate that. You know, anybody in healthcare should appreciate that. Um, potentially narrow their career choices. You know, maybe they do like working in lab more than they like working with patients or whatever. And then facilitate that. Those that do want to stay in the lab, facilitate that conversion from colleague, or, or from student really to colleague. You know, somebody that we can collaborate with after they graduate. Now, the two projects that I, I want to talk about today, I have a lot of little pet projects uh, in the lab, but the two that really tie in together um, are shown on the slide here. First one, is the discovery of selective inhibitors of, of PARP10 and PARP14. Those are enzymes, they're proteins, they're, they're, they're things that little workhorses of your body that are important for various functions. Okay, that's, I'm gonna use the term protein a lot, uh, and that's, that's what it is. And so, w w these weren't really well known back when I, I started here. I was familiar with the field, enough to make me dangerous, and I knew how to make molecules, again, enough to make me dangerous, probably, <laughs> I'm not going to go down that uh, breaking bad career path, but um, yeah, so, so, so PARP 10 and PARP 14 were the, the focus of my um, efforts the first few years here. Little did I know that would lead me into uh, the coronavirus immune response. Um, but the second part is, is a project that Lobby worked on last uh, summer. It's a design and synthesis and evaluation of inhibitors of SARS-CoV-2 macro domain. All right, let's talk uh, about the science a little bit. So. PARP, uh, PARPs, have, there's a family of them, okay? You can think about them as all a bunch of Pac-Mans, okay? And they have little different hats on, some have little different arms, and, but, but in general, they all have the Pac-Man structure. That's why they're all in the same family. Does that kind of make sense? Okay, good. So far, so good. Why are they important? Um, well, PARP1, the kind of founding member of the family, dad, I guess, I don't know, grandfather, um, is, is, it was my first drug discovery project. So I spent years working in this field, and I knew it very well. Um, now there are currently five FDA-approved PARP1 inhibitors for cancer treatment. They are becoming more and more um, relevant to cancer treatment, not just breast cancer and ovarian cancer, which is what they were first um, um, approved for, but other uh, uh, cancers as well. So they have a critical role in DNA repair uh, and DNA damage. So that is why they were a really kind of central target for drug discovery. Now, it, it is a big family. There's you know, 16 members of the family. Actually, it's closer to 17, but anyways, the, the, the issue was with all of these PARP1 inhibitors that were in, in humans, all of the approved drugs, um, is that they actually had the ability to pretty much knock out 
all the different PARP members of the family. Because, like, you know, he can think about it like this. If oloparvib is, is one of the, uh, the FDA-approved PARP inhibitors, that's this guy right here, um, you know, it's the blue piece. It's a triangle. And the triangle can fit in every single mouth of the Pac-Mans, right? So it has some interaction with all these other proteins. That left a lot of unanswered questions, right? So, so here they are. I mean, what is the specific role of all those other PARP family members? You know, that wasn't very clear at the time. A lot was known about PARP1. A little bit more about PARP2. Nothing pretty much about the rest of them. Um, so are there unwanted effects or toxicity due to inhibition? You know, that that's an important piece. Um, or do you actually need one that inhibits all of them? You know, so those are two questions that, that were kind of lingering. Um, the one that we really tried to answer is this third one. What's the specific, you know, what's the effect of specifically inhibiting one of these other members but not inhibiting PARP1? Okay, so that's kind of the question that we're trying to tackle. Um, where do we start? There's a lot of family members, right? Well, well, we decided to start in this lower right-hand quadrant with PARP10 and PARP14. So they're grouped together based on that little central Pac-Man, right? That's why that's called the catalytic domain. Um, they all use the same substrates. They all convert one substrate into something else, okay? But um, what we wanted to do is really focus on those that we thought would be most relevant for a cancer because that's where kind of all the effort was at the time. So there were some intriguing roles. When I started here, it was 2015, you know, so at the time you started to see more and more publications where PARP14 was mentioned with cell proliferation, cancer, cell proliferation, tumor genesis, et cetera, et cetera. And PARP10, pretty much the same thing, you know, myeloma, metastatic cancer, pancreatic cancer. So you got the impression that these might be some pretty good drug discovery targets. Okay, when I say a target, I mean we want to make that little triangle, to make that little triangle with some other spinach on it so that it specifically knocks out one of these two enzymes. That was the whole goal of the project when I started here. Okay, so I was fortunate enough to get some really phenomenal top line students, I will say that, and I'm going to, you know, have pictures of them throughout. Here was kind of our first couple goes at it. That's Kevin and Megan over there. They were presenting their work at UMBC, and then this is um, Ryan and Caitlin. So Caitlin's in graduate school now. Kevin's actually working with one of the, our trustees at his company. Um, Megan's soon to be nurse, uh, and then Ryan's in graduate school at UMBC. So um, designing these things and coming and making them, that was what we tried to do early on. Right, so, but before we get there, I need to, to kind of go over a definition or two. You may not know what a chemical probe is. I've said it a couple times, but what exactly is it? Um, it it's exactly what it sounds like. It's chemical. It's something that we're making in a lab, okay, where we want to do it, make it specifically so that it inhibits one thing and we can test the biological function then, test what is relevant about that major macromolecule, in our case, it's PARP10 or PARP14 and really study it in a broader biological context. So we're using it as a tool. We don't want to make a drug this early. You know, we don't have a billion dollars, at least last I checked. No, I just got a couple of them. <laughs> but yeah, I, I mean, you know, it takes a lot of time in order to make a drug. We really wanted to say, hey, world, you got a question. Go ahead, Shannon. Um, so you're saying that it specifically interacts with one protein, not Correct. Okay. Right. So like PARP. Normal PARP1 inhibitors, even though they're called PARP1 inhibitors, have a little inhibition at a lot of different family members. Okay, so it's not a really good tool for, for um, studying those enzymes. So okay, more of like a general that's right. That's right. And we want to be specific. All right. So what are some good characteristics of a chemical probe? It's got to be potent. Okay, potency is a term that we use to, to as a metric that we use to see what concentration can you really knock out that that protein. Okay, and we want that number to be as small as possible, right? You think about it, if you only need a little bit of it to knock out the protein, it's better than having to, you know, use shovelfuls of it, right? So it's got to be potent. It's got to be selective, okay? It can't inhibit every family member like all those PARP1 inhibitors do. Um, it's got to be aqueous, sol you know, solubility, uh, you know, eventually it's going to have to be tested in a cell line, which is typically, you know, an aqueous medium. So you've got to have some aqueous solubility. Metabolic stability, eventually maybe it gets tested in an animal, so you need that to be, to be a case too. The most important thing though is this last bullet here. It's gotta be widely available to the academic community. So we wanna publish this, get it out there, and hey, hey, big pharma, go ahead, take it. Whatever you need it for, just go ahead and take it. That was, that was a decision that in, in industry would never have been made, okay? Why is that? Because you need intellectual property on your ideas. 
I was not interested in that. I had no illusions that we were going to spend a billion dollars developing a new PARP inhibitor uh, and, and make it into a drug. I, I, I was realistic about it. Plus, I needed to get some papers out because I was new at this whole teaching and academia thing. Um, so I made it available to the community. And over the course of, say, three, four years, when we published these papers, um, I was now had collaborations all over Europe and in, in North America as well. Um, however, how do we do it? The nuts and bolts of it, okay? I'm going to start showing chemical structures. What are all these things here? <laughs> what is this? What is this? Um, where did we start? Where did we start? Well, fortunately enough, this paper came out right around the time that I, was, I decided to go into teaching. And um, they published, it, it was a really good structural biology group whom I contacted and begged and said, hey, will you please collaborate with me if I, if I make some molecules, will you test them? And they said, yes. I couldn't believe it, but because my name was in the field, he knew me. And, and he probably had reviewed a few of my papers or whatever. It was a nice collaboration to get set up with, and I was really happy about that. Um, but anyways, his group came up with, with a study where they did a lot of, they crystallized those little Pac-Man with the little triangle, okay? So what does that mean? That means we could actually see the crystal structure and how that little triangle binds into the Pac-Man. What, what, what's necessary, okay? And this was the first example of that. And what we saw is we were like, oh, well this, that's my pointer. Well this blue thing right here has, has three bonds. To, to the protein. So that's a really important piece. Let's leave that the hell alone and work with the rest of the molecule. All right, and that's, that's what we decided to do. Um, so we wanted to improve the potency of this. It was, it was in that micromolar range. So the IC50 is the measurement of how potent it is. And we're going to see IC50 values throughout this talk. So again, the lower that number is, the better it is. Okay, so that's what we're trying to do. Um, now, when you're first starting out, you, you got well, first of all, you want to give them a little confidence booster, man. You want to you know, throw a softball at them and say, hey, can you make these molecules? Th and this is pretty easy chemistry. I mean, it's, you know, high yielding. It's, it's one step. They can mix them and get a, get a nice specter of it. Oh, this looks great. And, and their confidence is there. And that's right where you need them. You need them at that sweet spot. So my first two students, Kristen Upton, who is, you know, just Miss McDaniel, absolute superstar, and then Matt Myers, who is now a dentist. Um, <laughs> Love Matt. Uh, they cranked out a bunch of compounds. They were able to make you know a whole series of these things. Okay, only difference being what's down in this range right here. Remember, leave that top piece alone. We know that's important for binding. But the bottom piece, we have no idea. We're kind of you know poking around. Um, what we found out in short order is that we could put instead of having an OH. Oh, let me get my pointer out. <laughs> well, instead of having this OH here, we just put a little ring there. We, we improved the potency almost in order of magnitude. That was our first kind of big discovery. Um, and then we're like, well, okay, let's keep going. Let's see what else is there. So, so interestingly enough, we found that if you put another ring there in, the, in that position, you can get it even more potent. Okay, so now we're getting down into that level of like being a useful chemical probe. However, and this is the big however, it was still pretty potent against PARP1. Okay, and remember, that's what we were trying to tease ourselves apart. Yeah, go ahead. So solubility are two different things, two different things, yeah, 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 don't confuse the two. Solubility, all these compounds are soluble at those concentrations, okay. Um, yeah, so back to, to kind of the best hit from this series. Um, compound MCD-113, this is shown over there on the left. Our collaborator was nice enough to, to crystallize this thing and send us the data, and we got a nice little poster out of it, we got a nice little paper out of it, However, again, that selectivity still wasn't there. You can think about it like this. Instead of just having a triangle, we put some more spinach on it, but it still fit into the, into the PARP1 active site, okay? So it wasn't as selective. Well, at this time, I was kind of down on it. I was like, gosh, man, you know, they did so much work, and it's really just not doing what I want it to do. Um, so I went to a PARP conference, okay? And this is where we had kind of the next big breakthrough. Um, at this conference, it was a, a Cold Spring Harbor, and the whole point of this conference was that people were presenting data that's not published, okay? And one of the groups was presenting kind of like latest hot off the press kind of stuff. And one of the groups was presenting um, some crystal structures with this compound over here, OUL35, um, in PARP14 and PARP10. And so we, we looked at it, and I took one look at that thing, and I said, you know what? I know everything about PARP1. There's no way 
that thing is going to inhibit PARP1, sure enough, okay, over, over 100 micro, really just completely dead against PARP1. And I said, well, maybe we can take his series and kind of mix it with our series and find something that's really useful. And that's exactly what we did. Okay, so their series, here's OUL35. Again, some of the same motifs that you've seen again and again. This, this blue part here is the same in both of our series. You have an oxygen approximately in the same spot as in, bo in both series. You have a planar group approximately in the same spot in both series. But what we knew about our series is that you can tack something else on there and reach that little side pocket, okay, and make it specific and make it more potent, okay? And that's exactly what we do. We basically try to meld these two together, some sort of linker in there to reach that side pocket, okay? The, the chemistry, well, it's still pretty easy. I mean, they, you know, the good, good news about it, I know she's laughing. She's like, oh, wait until you see what I had to go through, man. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's straightforward. A couple steps, and, and I had a good group of kids at the time, too, that were able to just crank through and make a bunch of molecules, um, and we got some really good um, activity data, and it's pretty much exactly, it's nice when a plan comes together. It's pretty much what happened here. So we made this molecule, ZMCD72. Um, very potent against PARP10, not so much against PARP14, um, but zero, again, I didn't put it up here, but it completely dead against PARP1, which was good. Okay, now we're at least selective for PARP10, okay? Um, and sure enough, we got a crystal structure of them. We found out that this group is sitting in the same pocket as this guy over here. So it's nice when a plan comes together. Presented this work, uh, Jake and Bobby, here th they are. Jake is now um, working at Agilent, and Bobby is at graduate school at the uh, University of Maryland. Um, they made these two compounds here. The interesting thing about these two, and they'll come back later, is by changing minor modifications of the structure, just changing one atom, for example, it completely flipped the selectivity from PARP10 to PARP14. So now all of a sudden we have molecules that are you know, more potent against PARP14 than PARP10, not potent at all against PARP1. Okay, so we now have a tool, a PARP10 inhibitor that's reasonably selective, a PARP14 inhibitor is reasonably selective, and we published it. Okay, and what's the upshot of doing that? Well, you now have all these groups around the planet that want to, you know, ha can I have a little bit of that? Can I try a little bit in this model? One of the groups was Dr. Anthony Fear from the University of Kansas. Um, he was a virologist. <laughs> I said, I don't think PARP14 has anything to do with virology. I, I, you know, what the heck, you know? But he, 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 he kind of opened my eyes a little bit, and Anthony too. I knew Anthony from Hopkins, and he, he said, you know, Dana, <laughs> the PARPs have been known to be involved in a lot of the immune responses for, for viruses. And, um, you know, I was like, yeah, okay, but, you know, cancer, 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 you know? So I wasn't too interested in all that. Well, um, enter the pandemic. Okay, so here we are at the beginning of the, the pandemic. Um, I was kind of crestfallen, as you can imagine. My favorite time of year is the summertime, it, it getting to do research and playing bocce ball. And, and who's the best bocce ball player? Eat bagels. Uh, eat bagels, that's right. Eat bagels. Um, He's yeah, the bocce so ball champion. Bocce ball champion. There's Dr. Faraz and everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> um, so fun, best time of the year. Okay. However, you guys remember that. Everybody acutely remembers you know, closing the campus down. It was a bad three months. Uh, during that period of time, our, one of our major instruments which needs to be maintained regularly um, really went downhill uh, so we had to get that back up and running um, I had to beg and plead thankfully uh, uh, my provost at the time who is who is the the president now um, was uh, insightful enough to to allow a few students back on campus so we were actually the first students back on campus here they are right here um, in that picture so you have Myself and the Yoda ears up top, and then you have Max and Zoe and, and um, Zach and Priscilla and Chase. And so all those, all those folks were, I, I said, you know, do you guys want to curl up in the fetal position and stay home, or do you want to do some, make some molecules? There's no self-respecting medicinal chemist that's going to sit on the sidelines in a pandemic. And so um, the administration let, let us come back. A limited number only for, for coronavirus research. And I, you know, at the time, didn't think much about, you know, what, what, uh, yeah, I said, well, there's plenty of targets out there. Everybody's working on it. You know, th this virus is important, and maybe I can contribute in just a little way. Um, so enter the second kind of part that, that I, I mentioned a little earlier. PARPs tend to be very, very active in an immune response to a virus. 
So a virus hits your cell, okay? And then what PARPs do is they start sending up red flags right and left, okay? They put little tags on all these little proteins. Some are viral proteins, some are proteins that stimulate the immune system. Whatever it is, that's what PARPs do. I didn't know this until recently. Um, but that's kind of what, what, what's shown here. The only thing that wasn't really known is which PARPs are actually responsible for doing that. Which of the family members actually do that? Um, so viruses don't just sit and, and take it. They, they've evolved to be really tricky little beasties. And so what the viruses do is they've evolved a way of, of, of taking those little tags and just snipping them right off. Okay, so they basically hide themselves from the immune system, if that makes sense. The um, protein that does that is called a viral macrodomain. Okay, so, so the viral macrodomain is basically undoing everything that the PARP enzymes are doing. So it's really, really tricky. And my collaborator at the University of Kansas, you know, he was like, well, let me just see if PARP14 is one of those proteins. Well, sure enough, it was. And we actually published this paper, so we got a nice little paper out of it. Using MCD91, there's Bobby. I said, hey, Bobby, we got a paper. And that's what he said afterwards. He was like, what? Really? This is awesome. Um, he never looks like that. I mean, I, he probably had one tie, like me, you know, one tie. <laughs> but, you know, I caught him on a good day, if, if you will. Um, so we had this paper published in, in 20, like right before the, the 2019, you know, uh, coronavirus reared its ugly head. Meanwhile, I didn't even know what a coronavirus was. I, I was just kind of like, oh, it was great. We got a publication out of it. And Bobby's name's on it. Oh, it's even better. Um, this, this group right here, Stanley Perlman and, and Fear, these guys are, are heavyweights now because of this virus. They probably know more about this virus because they've been studying it for 20 years than, than everybody else combined. I mean, so, so being able to be on a publication with them pre-pandemic, I just, I, Anthony, what do you need me to do? You know, what do you need me to do? And he says, well, we're working on an assay for the macrodomain. Okay, there's a lot of effort going into this right now. So all this effort, because everybody's now interested in it, this kind of leads into the second half of the talk and why the macrodomain is such a good target. But um, this is kind of how I felt at the time. You know, design inhibitors for part 4 it's a great drug target, drug discovery target for cancer, yes. And then, of course, all the virologists don't inhibit PARP14. It's absolutely necessary for the immune response. You dummy. Inhibit the macrodomain instead. At the time, no inhibitors for the macrodomain. Very, very difficult drug target. But Lobby's going to go into that, so I'm going to turn it over to her right now. So nothing is as easy as it seems, right? So um, Viral macrodomains as a drug target was known for the past 10 years, but they were really not actual practical ones. Um, they had some issues. Uh, basically, we found out that uh, the virus are mutating and they can remove that little tag that the immu immune system puts on them. And also um, in, the, in the assays, um, they weren't doing a very good job. Um, the picture, summarizes the way that uh, PAR14, macrodomain, and the uh, um, coronavirus are tied together. So if you start at the you coronavirus cell, uh, the pointer, thank you. It's not straight <laughs> though, you can't have So this is uh, the time where the coronavirus infects the body, the host. Um, PAR14 is producing an immune response it basically puts this little green tag on the host protein and the viral protein, but the macrodomain is trying to remove that, and it's removing it and hides the virus from, um, from the immune system. Okay, uh, thanks to the pandemic and everybody knowing that the macrodomain was a good target, they came out with uh, different papers. They were trying to um, summarize different molecules that they found. We started with this paper published in um, the spring of 2021, which is right before that summer I did the research. And um, we started with those two molecules. They show the most potent. And um, we realized that both of them kind of had this two ring system. 
And we decided we we're going to start there and find a molecule that's close enough to these structures and try to build, um, it's called a fragment growth, and build our new molecules. OK, designing antivirals. <laughs> All these um, beautiful structures, <laughs> it was hard to make. It wasn't that easy, <laughs> as you will see in some of the uh, next pictures. Um, basically, we started with this. I worked on uh, primary amino acid derivatives, and uh, we had two other uh, girls, Elva and Anne-Marie, and they work with uh, secondary amino acid derivatives. We tried to test all that, build the molecule, to quote George, which he also worked. If you have a glove and you filled uh, one of the fingers of the glove, we tried to fill all the rest of the four fingers. So it's more, um, more potent. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, well, that's not my <laughs> OK, so this is the synthesis. This is what I did over the summer multiple times. Uh, and uh, this is like um, pages of history because this is my lab notebook. So every single page in here kind of looks like this. And you have the reactions and everything you put in the pot to kind of boil those um, molecules. Um, oh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you can see here that we kept that two ring system. We added some of the amino acids derivative, and through a reaction called nucleophilic aromatic substitution, we kind of grew our starting molecule. After we started that, we um, had the ester. Once we had the ester, we realized that we needed a carboxylic acid, which is that OHO at the end. And we did an ester hydrolysis to transform all molecule to the carboxylic acid. Uh, because that showed even more uh, potency. And this was our whole team. Um, Ian, George, me, Dr. Ferraris. The president was also involved because you know she was always there supporting us every time we needed something. She was always there on top of everything. Elva, Anne-Marie, and Princess. And this here <laughs> is how one reaction looked like. I did 37 reactions. And for every single one of this, that's how my bench looked like, <laughs> OK? At the end of the summer, uh, I had this much compounds from every reaction that I made. Some of these are good. Some of these are not as good. But one of them is the star of the show. OK, so like I said before, the structure has a relationship with the activity. You have those. Um, the azindol ring, which is the two ring system in red, we kept that through the whole series. So everything we build, we build starting from that. Then we kept the amine, then we added some more. Um, the ones that had the aster at the end weren't as potent, but the ones that had the carboxylic acid, so like this bottom series, they're most potent along the series. So like that IC50 number, you see it's all over the place for both of them. But still, the MCD628, that was the start of the show, my own compound. <laughs> First person on the planet to make it. First person on the planet. Well, I was about to say that. <laughs> uh, so I brought the notebook because this is a piece of the history. Because at this time, it's the most potent macrodomain inhibitor that exists on the planet, and I made it. So <laughs> I call it Lavinia 14, <laughs> because my name is Lavinia, and if I uh, made it, I get to name it, right? <laughs> um, yeah, we can put it in the periodic table. Somebody today at um, PT, which is physical training in the morning with the ROTC, asked me, so how many elements in the periodic table? I said, that's not the most important part <laughs> of chemistry, because I just added one. <laughs> <laughs> so. OK, so we tested my compound and the other compounds against a series, like a panel of macro domains. And we realized these are all human. These are other macro domains. And we realized that it's selective for the actual SARS COVID, the macro domain, um, and the MERS COVID. So all of these are coronaviruses. But what we were very happy about is this MAC1, which is the macro domain. It show 
the highest inhibition and selectivity. And of course, this would have been not possible without the help of um, the people from the different universities. I think I, I had the number, the names, Anthony Fur from University of Kansas and Dr. Larry Letio. From that research, we end up writing a paper, which I'm the first author because I made the most compounds and uh, my MCD 628, aka Lavinium 14, <laughs> is, was the most, com most potent. And um, this is basically the series. Uh, what we have here is how it binds to the protein. So all these little ribbons here is the protein. And what we have in the middle is um, our macrodomain inhibitor. All right. So thank you, Lavi. Um, amazing, right, that, that an undergrad can do this? I mean, yeah, we can give her a hand. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Um, I just kind of wanted to wrap back around to some of the challenges and, and you know, here are my solutions to it and I think that, that you know, collaboration is key, you know, without, as, as Lobby mentioned, Anthony Fear and, and Larry Lagshow, I mean, they're tremendous collaborators, um, hearts in it, you know, we, we, we wrote a grant together, hopefully, you know, fingers crossed we get that, um, real drivers for getting this paper out there, which was really nice. Um, McDaniel Summer Research Program, right? So they uh, have made a considered effort to really get a lot of kids involved in the summer research program. So that has been, I think, a tremendous success. Um, and then some very generous donors who I will show on the acknowledgement slides. Now, what if you have lack of students in the discipline? Well, expand the scope a little bit. You know, I think I'm taking seven students this summer, maybe one's a chemist. Everybody else is maybe pre-med, PA, whatever. Um, but that's okay. Uh, and then willingness and interest, you know, design projects that they feel are meaningful and impactful. I think that this one's an easy one to wrap your mind around and really say, hey, there's a need for antivirals. Now, vaccines aren't for everybody, you know, and having an antiviral, um, you know, armory is, is super important. Um, student schedules, yeah, do research over the summer or jan term. That's, that seems to be the most successful. Time constraints, I don't know, I have no idea for that one. If you guys got any, hey, share them with me, I have no. Um, acknowledgements, yeah, so my mentors, I've had some, I've been really, really fortunate. Uh, Tom Letka and Vince, Vince was my first boss. Takashi and Tom are both Maryland chemists of the year at one point or another, really good uh, collaborators. Herbert Schuler was the crystallographer that we had for a part project, he was wonderful. Anthony Fear we talked about a lot, in Dr. Perlman's uh, group as well. Uh, and then Larry from University of Oulu. Um, so then the funding is coming from McDaniel Academic Affairs. Um, it's coming from the Richards Fund, Schofield Fund, Dane Fund, Hopkins Fund, Smith Fund. I mean, it's, it's been great. It's been really wonderful. They've been super supportive. Um, so I'll, I'll take charge here. Yeah. So my mentor, Dr. Ferraris, <laughs> I never thought that research is possible. I come from a place where, you know, research is such an attainable goal. So the fact that, you know, during the organic chemistry classes, he just came and was so excited, let's do research, let's build proteins or molecules, let's do this. <laughs> I'm like, what is he talking about? I'm just here, you know, to do my pre-med. And then he just got us all excited and it was just a wonderful experience. The six weeks that we did the research over the summer, he was always there. Then like the, the last couple weeks, he's like, oh, I'm just gonna take a day break. <laughs> I'm going to the beach. You got this. Going, so, on, a, going on a boat with Kat. Right, and we were there in the lab trying to troubleshoot everything. <laughs> but that was a good thing because all yeah, of us need to be. bonded and we didn't have to call him. Hey, my reaction is not going. So mm -hmm. we've kind of figured out by ourselves. <laughs> Teamwork. He was gone is when you made the actual Probably. Right, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> right. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Dr. Ferraris. And now the uh, students that are going to do research this summer are going to build upon what we, we try to make and go from there, try to switch some more mm -hmm. little groups around the molecule of mm -hmm. Lavinium-14. <laughs> That's right. But if they need help, you can give me a call. I'll be at <laughs> camp. <laughs> So yes, that takes me to, to my acknowledgments of the students. I mean, nothing's possible without their help. I mean, I, you look, if I was to go back and lab, you know, stuff would get broken. I'm not gonna lie to you. It would be pretty messy. 
So I need somebody to make molecules. Uh, you know, so these are my indentured servants for the past you know, seven years or whatever. Um, the ones that are highlighted here did the, the, the macro domain work. They're all actually on the paper. So Elva, George, Patrick, and, and Lavi and Anne-Marie. Um, Princess and Husick also worked on protease inhibitors with me, same with Zoe. Um, and then, and Max, and Jace, and Priscilla, and Zach as well. But then, you know, you going back, you've got some, some heavy hitters over there that are now doctors and PAs and, and all sorts of things and graduate, graduating from, from good universities with PhDs. So um, some, I've, I've been privileged to, ha to have these guys. I mean, I, I figure that, that this has been the best blessing right here. So obviously, students. Um, then, of course, I told Lavi, I said, you know, without family, none of this is possible. I mean, you can't, you need, you need the foundation, right? You need it. So, and I said, you got to put your family pictures on here, too, because once you work in my lab, then we're family. That's, that's the way it goes. So, um, anyways, thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions, too. <laughs> George, George. I expected that. So uh, just, okay, just a little background on George. For every chemistry class, there's George and the rest of the class, okay? So of course he has a question. All right, so given um, that your labinium 14 was the uh, most potent compound, and you actually got a nice crystal structure out of it, and, and the, this summer um, we will have you know, more research being done on that, um, what kind of derivatives um, do you suspect Um, I think anything that you can get out of, um, like around it would be good. Um, I'm not sure if, say, you take one of the um, carboxylic acids and maybe you add some more, maybe fill another of those pockets. Maybe that would be a good route to take. Is there a pocket in particular that you're thinking about? Like, is there a pocket that is more hydrophobic or is hydrophilic, possibly has binding interactions that you might speculate with? This is actually a nice little hydrophobic pocket right here. And so if you build off from like what she said, that carboxylic acid, make amides or whatever, you can still maintain a hydrogen bond here, but also carve out a little spot. Yeah. That's, that's where part of the, yeah, and I have some research students that are gonna be working over the summer. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, Devin, yeah, I see you. You can't hide, Alessandra, even though you're on the floor. <laughs> um, so yeah, that, that's definitely two avenues. One uh, from the carboxylate. The other one is to, kind of swap out this aromatic group. This is a, actually is a channel, and so we want to kind of fill that channel as well. Yep. Um, other questions? Alessandra. Alessandra. Um, why do you, so you might have speculated that the ester and the ester derivative was um, less potent than the ester. Yeah, you want to take that one? Um, I believe it's because you have more um, um, places to bond it with the protein. Mm -hmm, that's correct, right? So here's our, this is the initial uh, fragment. And you can see there's two hydrogen bonds between these two nitrogens and the protein. But you can also see that carboxylic acid wraps around and forms another couple. And so when we built all these molecules, we kind of built that w with that part in mind. You know, we want to move that carboxylate till it's just where it has to be. And in this structure here, you can kind of see that, okay? This is, this is again, same two residues as was in that fragment, okay? Good question. Mm -hmm. All right, other questions? All right, well, if there are no further, thank you for your attention. It was good to see the room full, and um, happy hour. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Don't destroy my Lavinia for team, though. <laughs> <laughs> <Wow>. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah.